Am I on? There we go. Uh, so glad uh, you've chosen to be here today. Nice to see some, some faces. Uh, saw Amber here and Austin there here. Good to see you guys and others. But anyway, it's good to see everybody here today. And uh, here on Resurrection Sunday... But I know that some of you may very well be feeling empty today. But I want you to know there is a God who can fill your emptiness with life. He can fill it with purpose. He can fill it with hope. So happy Resurrection Day. That's contrary to what the White House says. The White House said that this is Transgender Visibility Day. But I want you to know they're wrong. Today is Resurrection Day. And because of Easter, you can be completely forgiven of sin. You can become a child of the living God. Your sins can be washed away, forgotten by God as if you've never committed them. Speaking of forgetting, that reminds me, I heard about these three sisters. They were 36, 94, and 92, and they lived together. And one day, the 96-year-old drew a bath and put one foot in and stopped. And she hollered downstairs, and she said, I can't remember if I'm getting in or getting out. The 94-year-old said, just a second, I'll come up and help you. She got up halfway the stairs and stopped. She said, I, I can't remember if I was going up or down. The 92-year-old shook her head and said, I, I hope I never get that forgetful. She knocked on wood for good luck. And then she said, hold on, I'll come help you out as soon as I see who's at the door. They quickly forgot. They forgot. Well, in a sense, here's the truth. Easter is about God forgetting. You see, our sins can be forgotten because of three empty promises kept that happened that first Easter 2,000 years ago. The world promises a great life without God, but it never really quite delivers anything that brings lasting joy or lasting peace the world leaves people empty a teenager summed up a lost generation this way she carved the word empty on her forearm somebody said our greatest fear should not be a failure but really of succeeding at something that just doesn't really matter could call it empty success a politician admitted this right before he died. He was on his deathbed and some people were attending to him and they were talking to him. And this is what he had to say. He said, you know, it's all about acquiring wealth and power and prestige. He said, I acquired more wealth, power and prestige. But I'm still empty. You know, even toys are empty. A U.S. company has an action figure called Invisible Jim. And he also had Invisible Jen. It sells for eight pounds in Britain and 10 bucks here. Why is it called Invisible Gym? Because that's all you get, the packaging. <laughs> there is no gym. Empty, empty. <laughs> on it, it says, uh, on the packaging, it says, lack of darting eyes, realistic fake hair, as not seen on TV empty and people pay for it in 1985 some of you remember Geraldo Rivera some of you do and in 85 old Geraldo was at the very top of his game he was a journalist and he covered all kinds of interesting stories and and so people just just thought everything that came out of his mouth was just solid gold and but in a matter of moments in 1985 he went from being a respected journalist to a total laughing stock Geraldo claimed that he had found Al Capone's secret vault. Remember this? Some of you? And would unearth the contents on national television. Al Capone, the famous gangster. They'd found his vault, and they couldn't wait to get in there, and Geraldo wanted to break the story. And by his own admission, he had no idea what was in the vault. And so the show, I remember watching, watching it, and for an hour he starts just you know, telling this you know, tale of this incredible riches that are probably going to be found in there millions of dollars in gold and all sorts of things are going to be in Al Capone's vault. 
They finally opened it, and it was empty. Well, the world's promises are as empty as Al Capone's vault. You know, sin promises us a good time. Sin is missing the mark. It is missing God's standard. It is doing things our own way with our own desires. But in its wake, in sin's wake, it really ultimately leaves us empty. And it leaves a stain of stink on us too. Whether we know it or not, there's, there's a stench of sin on us. As you know, uh, many of you know I was a sanitary engineer. I was a G-man. And I worked for waste control and, you know, I used to drive one of those automated trucks and, you know, go down and, you know, you just do the things and the arms go out and empty the garbage and you go down. You see them today. And uh, actually, I loved the job. It was really fun. But my job was, of course, to, to remove broken and worn out and half-eaten food and diaper-laden garbage from homes. Well... For, like I say, for the most, most part, I really liked the job. And I was by myself listening to the radio, and I had some fun and all that. But um, one particular day, it was about this time of the year, spring had hit, and everybody was mowing their lawns, and, and the garbage cans were just totally full and really heavy. And then there's the big tubs in the alleys, some of them. So I was going down one of the alleys, and you know, I reached out my arm and grabbed it, and then I, you know, usually you just hit the accelerator and just fires right up. But this time it hit it and it was like, mm, 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 mm. I was like, man, this thing's got to be pretty heavy, but I'm going to, I'm going to get her up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Finally, it got to the top and went, dun, 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 and the tub slipped through into the back. So that means I get the joy of going in the back and lifting it up and going amidst the garbage. So I go back there and, uh, Unfortunately, none of the garbage had slipped out. This, this sucker was full. And so I summoned my superhuman strength. <laughs> and I went, went down and I just, you know, pushed it up against the wall and just started. <laughs> oh, oh my. Got down on my knees and, just, and it still wouldn't come out. Full of grass and full of, somebody put concrete in there. I beg you not to do that. <laughs> so I had tons of concrete and tons of rotten eggs and tons of grass that had been smelling there for all week and the other and the sun and the wet and the rain. <laughs> so just <laughs> I got my back into it. Still nothing came out. Finally I was like Pun -da 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 -da, like that. And then it came. I could never figure out. I got home and they said, honey, I'm home. I, I expected this big warm kiss and a hug. Somehow she didn't do that. So I took her and said, get in the shower. <laughs> Woo! So I went in the shower and I scrubbed extra hard. But you know what's, what's weird about working in garbage is that, you know, you have to pick up pick it up physically and you have to use the, all that and you shovel it and what's weird is it didn't matter how much I would scrub there was still some dirt and grime and gunk somewhere deep in my in my fingerprints and my hands and I would just scrub it never really came out not entirely you see our best efforts to try to clean ourselves up from sin just don't work. Sin stays with us. And it still stinks. There's this flower. Apparently it's, it's on the extinction list. It's called a corpse flower. Anybody heard of this thing? Yeah. It's, a, it's a true thing. And you see that poor kid, you know, with his nose. They call it the smelliest plant on earth, the reekiest. And um, it smells like rotten meat. 
And so it attracts all these bugs and these bees and insects and beetles. And, and it looks like something's died. It smells like something has died. And, it, and interestingly enough, this plant produces the same chemicals that dead bodies produce. But unlike any other plant that offers nectar, there's no reward for the insects that go in there. There's none. They expect it, but there's none. They think they're getting a meal because it smells like something died. And the truth is, that's really the story of sin. It holds out promises, yet has no real true rewards. Now, for a season, we all know that sin is enjoyable for a season for a period of time, maybe for a few minutes, maybe for days, weeks, sometimes a little longer, months. But eventually, the pain from the sin starts catching up to the enjoyment of the sin, <laughs> and the stink is on us. And there's a certain scent to stink, to the stink of sin. Interestingly enough, when people turn from sin and they receive Christ, some of those who used, they used to party with don't want to be around him anymore because they don't like the new scent of that person. When you come to Christ, there's a different aroma about you. And many in the world just don't like it anymore. They were okay with you being around. I'll give you an example uh, in my own way of it. Years ago, we went on a, a mission trip to Mexico. I've been on several of those. Some of you have been on those and different mission trips. I encourage you to to take a mission trip too, by the way. It'll, it'll really uh, stick with you in a good way. But on this particular mission trip, we were in Mexico, and um, the guys, the boys, we were all sleeping in sleeping bags, and it was on a total dirt floor. And, but on this particular trip, uh, there was no showers, none. And so we were there for seven, eight days straight, no shower, no nothing. But you know, the, the amazing thing is, we didn't stink at least not to each other. <laughs> we all smelled the same way, so there was no problem. It's just like, hey, you know, I really don't need deodorant anymore. I thought that I did. <laughs> and it was wonderful until the day somebody went to a store and bought some shampoo. And then there was a well near where we were, and so they grabbed some well water and poured it on her hair, and she began to wash, and all I could smell, oh, she stinks! I didn't like that fragrance, that powerful, overwhelming smell of the shampoo. See, she was washed. When we're washed by Christ, we're truly clean. But Jesus warns us that not everybody's going to be excited when we come to Christ and we decide to follow Jesus. In fact, some will do just the opposite. And it's up to you and I to decide which group you want to fit into, the cleansed and the forgiven or the unwashed and not forgiven. And because of Easter, you have a choice which team you want to be on. I came across this story from a few years ago. A young man from a wealthy family was about to graduate from high school, and it was the custom in that really affluent neighborhood for parents to give the graduating senior a car. And so Bill, we'll call the kid Bill, and his father had spent months looking at cars, and the week before graduation, they found the perfect car. And so on the eve of his graduation, the father handed him a gift-wrapped Bible. And Bill was so angry that he grabbed the Bible and he just smashed it on the ground. He stormed out of the house, and he and his father never saw each other again. And it was the news of his father's death that brought Bill home again. And as he sat one night going through his father's possessions that he was to inherit, he came across the Bible that his father had given him. So he brushed away the dust and opened it to find a cashier's check dated the day of his graduation in the exact amount of the car they had chosen together. And as I think about that story, I can't help but wonder how many of us have missed the promise and the gift that goes along with it. Many know that the world's promises are full of emptiness. We know, we hear promises from our, you know, our government and this guy and that person and whatever, and many of them are not kept. You know, promises like if you 
If you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or read my lips, no new taxes. <laughs> that worked out real well. But I want you to know that God makes promises too. But the difference is God always keeps his promises. God always keeps them. Now they're conditional. He'll say, if you do this, this is what I will do. So if you do that little bit he's asking you to do, you will get that promise. Period. End of story. End of discussion. He doesn't keep moving the goalposts like people tend to do. And the Bible actually records over 7,000 promises from God to his people. And they're full promises. I like this. On the first Easter Sunday, instead of promises full of emptiness, God gave us emptiness that is full of promise. Say it again. On the first Easter Sunday, instead of promises full of emptiness, God gave us emptiness that is full of promise. On the other hand, the devil makes all kinds of promises that he doesn't keep. He doesn't intend to keep them either. He's a liar. Never stops tempting. Never stops reminding you and I of our guilt. He never stops rubbing our nose in the very thing he tempted us to do in the first place. So he, he tempts us to do something. We do it. And he rubs our nose in it. Just like I used to do with, with we had a dock. And he would, he would leave a little present on the carpet. And I'd be, bad dog, you know. And I'm sure he had no, what are you doing? This actually smells pretty good, you know. He, he had no idea. But the devil, you know, I, I want you to go look at that porn video. I want you to cheat that. You know, don't pay that guy. Don't do that. Don't help him. Cover yourself. Lie about that. Whatever, whatever it is. And you do it and you follow through. And then once you do it and you feel guilty, you want to come back to the Lord, he'll rub your nose in it. Bad, bad. God would never accept you. He's a liar. He's a liar. He never stops tempting. The devil does it to keep us ashamed. He wants us to think we're too dirty to turn to the living holy God. And so the devil just keeps poking us and poking us. You know, that reminds me, I heard about a man who said, my wife yelled from upstairs and asked, hey, do you ever feel a shooting pain across your body like someone's got a voodoo doll of you and they're stabbing it? He said, no. She said, how about now? <laughs> <laughs> we all have a list of sins. We all have a list of sins, don't we? Your sins might be different than mine. Maybe your sin is exploding in anger. Maybe your sin is just flat unforgiveness. Maybe your sin is pride. Maybe you're addicted to something. Maybe you're just so full of lust. Maybe you're just, you lie. You just, you hardly, you can't even hardly tell. You just lie all the time. Maybe you're just selfish or you're prone to sexual promiscuity. My sins are different maybe than some of yours, but each of us has a rather long list. And every sin on your list and my list has a price tag. And a lifetime of sin is enough to rack up some major debt. You yell and scream at your kids, cha-ching. You covet your friend's car, cha-ching. You envy your neighbor's success, cha-ching. You lie, cha-ching. You lose control, cha-ching. You give into temptation, cha-ching. You doze off during my sermon, cha-ching, cha-ching, <laughs> cha-ching. And so further and further we go into debt. And we can never, ever pay it back. Try as we might. Some people figure that maybe I'll balance the scales. I know what I'll do. I'll just go to church more. I'll, maybe I'll We'll give a few more bucks in the plate. Maybe I'll just be, I'll try to be a good guy, a good person. And I think maybe if my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, then I'm pretty sure I'll 
go to heaven. I mean, that's probably the way it works, right? Well, the Bible tells us that the payment for sin is death. Simply put, the cost of your sins is more than you and I could ever pay. But the grace of God is more than you can imagine. So we're going to look at the three empty promises of Easter. Before we do that, Luke chapter 24, a few verses from Luke. Dr. Luke, who traveled with the Apostle Paul, a great historian. We know that the book of Acts and Luke are, are tied together. Luke wrote both of them. And this is what Luke has to say about this, about this time. And all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, record the story. And each of them has a different angle, a little, little bit from a different perspective, but they're all saying the same thing. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, first day of the week is Sunday. On Sunday of the first of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the tomb bringing the spices they had prepared and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They went in, but did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men stood by them in dazzling clothes. And so the women were terrified and bowed down to the ground. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Asked the men. He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you that when he was in Galilee saying, it is necessary that the son of man be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified and rise on the third day. And they remembered his words. Returning from the tomb, they reported all these things to the 11 and to all the rest. There was Mary Magdalene and Joanna, Mary the mother of James and all the other women with them were telling the apostles these things. But these words seemed like nonsense to them, and they did not believe the women. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb, and when he stooped to look in, he saw only the linen cloths, and so he went away amazed at what had happened. Amazed at what had happened. Well, Easter reminds us of a few things, a few empty things. First, Easter reminds us of the empty cross, the empty cross. We know that Jesus was crucified between two thieves just outside Jerusalem roughly 2,000 years ago. Scholars are sure that Jesus was crucified in one of two places in Israel, and Nancy and I, some of you have been to Israel, you, you've seen them, and I, we got to see the two spots that they believe. One of the two was where Jesus was crucified in Golgotha, and here's a picture of one of those. Uh, they consider that to be kind of a, the skull. And so there, if you look close enough, you might be able to see that. But that's where they think one of the spots was. Another one was somewhere else, not too far away from that, actually. But it shows you that Christianity is a historical faith. There's places, there's dates, there's, you know, I mean, one of the beautiful things, and one of the reasons we want to defend Israel is because that's where most of the magic happened, was certainly with Jesus and the apostles and um, and Paul and you know all the way from you know Abraham and all that it's all there in fact we saw Abraham's tomb that's what they call it and uh, 4,500 years old it's amazing the things that that we saw when we were there but these are places and what they've found archaeology has found is that as they keep digging these th things up in Israel and it takes a lot of time and money and effort to dig it up because there's been buildings built on top so they have to tear these buildings down and dig down and there it is there's the pool of Siloam there it is there's the pool of Bethesda there it is all these all these things and places and they, they they come back and here's what's happened the Bible has been proven over and over to be accurate at least archaeologically and it's never once been proven false never once never once there's reasons to trust it. It's, Christianity is not a blind faith. It's not a blind faith. You don't just, well, if I just, you know, if I just feel it, you know, that's the thing. It doesn't matter what's true or not. You just got to feel it. No, it's not a Christianity. It's not a blind faith. It's based on fact. Now, if we were to look up at the top of the cross, we would see blood stains from the crown of thorns that crushed into Jesus' skull. The stains on the ends of the crossbar, they came from the nails that were driven into his hands. Actually, a lot of people think it was in this little hole where the carpal tunnel is. That's where people might think it went. Can you imagine the pain? I can't. The main beam, it was soaked in blood, blood from his back, 
blood that was bled when Roman soldiers beat him with the cat of nine tails. And they say there was bits of bone and glass in there. And they were experts at this. The word uh, crucifixion comes to us from the word means excruciating, agony. And so Jesus took the lash for you and I. And his blood was spilled. It also has stains from the blood that poured from his side when another Roman soldier ran a spear through him to make sure that he was dead. And the promise of the empty cross is that you and I can now stand forgiven because he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. When Jesus was on the cross, he literally became your sin and my sin. That's why the father <laughs> couldn't look at him. My God, why have you forsaken me? He couldn't look on it. All of our sin was poured out upon him on the cross. Because of him, we stand forgiven if we meet the condition of receiving him and confessing him as Lord and believing that God has raised him from the dead. But here's the problem. According to God's law, the wages of sin is death. He says the soul that sins will surely die. Because we have sinned, we deserve God's just punishment. We just do. We deserve uh, separation from God. We deserve eternal separation from God. In other words, we deserve hell. However, when you look at that empty cross, it is a reminder that our sin account is empty. There's no balance anymore. Where'd it go? It's gone. All the debt that you owe, millions and billions and trillions and trillions of dollars, it's boink, wiped away, wiped clean. On that day, every name who has called upon the name of the Lord, who wrote in Jesus' blood, forgiven, sins forgotten. The empty Christ cross means your sin is empty or that your sin account is empty and Easter also reminds us of the empty tomb it's interesting that the Bible records that women were the first to see the empty tomb that's actually a significant thing we'll talk about it in a moment but suddenly the stone was moved and an angel glowing like lightning is sitting on it and he said don't be afraid for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified he's not here he has risen but women played a pivotal role in the early church and the spreading of the gospel. Dr. Luke, who traveled extensively with the Apostle Paul, and he's, uh, and he's known as an incredible historian, of the four gospels, he's the one that's Mr. Historian. And he recorded that there were several women who first found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They saw the empty tomb. Now, in first century Judaism, a woman's testimony was not considered reliable. That's why Peter and the other ones, that's not, you're talking nonsense. You're making this up. Your testimony is meaningless. You're a woman after all. Well, that's really an important fact. And I'll tell you why. It's because if the disciples were going to make up and invent a resurrection story, they wouldn't have chosen women to be the first to see and declare it. It would have gone against the grain of everything that they understood to be true. So they, but the Bible doesn't do that. The Bible doesn't tell us what we want to hear. It just tells us the way it is. It doesn't pull punches. That's why our heroes in the Bible, they'll talk about the good things they did and the failures. I mean, if I was writing a story, you know, and I wanted it to shine wonderful about me, a biography, I would probably leave out a lot of the dirt. The Bible doesn't do that. glad I'm not in the Bible. <laughs> the women played a pivotal role. And everything changed when Jesus came. Suddenly the rights of women were considered. Women went from being proper to being full equal partners in this deal. There's no longer Jew or Gentile, male or female. You know. The empty tomb redeemed men and women. In the Garden of Eden, the account of Genesis tells us that Eve was deceived, of course, and ate the forbidden fruit and then handed it to Adam and Eve. Or, at, excuse me, Adam and he ate. And a woman was the first to, to sin by eating the forbidden fruit. Okay, so let's just track with me here a little bit. 
and Adam ate as well and she handed it to him. It was paradise lost. Man's relationship with God was then broken. Man was kicked out of Eden, kicked out of the garden. And since then, though, Eve has taken an undue amount of, you know, shame, I suppose, and blame for doing that. But I, what I love about what happened with Jesus and the women seeing the tomb is it went farther than that. Women, not, uh, women were not only the first to see the empty tomb, but in John 20, 15, this is what happens. This is what it, John records. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And then I love this. Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned and said to him, Rabbi, meaning teacher, meaning Lord. Meaning, and Mary assumed Jesus was the gardener. Why did she assume this guy was the gardener? Because it was placed in a garden in the middle of an empty tomb. Now, why is that important? Women were the first to see the empty tomb and Mary Magdalene the first to see the resurrected Jesus in a garden. And this time, instead of introducing death to the world by giving forbidden fruit to Adam, bringing expulsion from the garden, a woman sees Jesus in a garden and introduces the risen Lord to, to the world, bringing eternal life to all who believe in him. Women had a part to play. That's what Jesus does. He restores things. He restores people. <clears throat> His life and death and resurrection mattered and matter today. And the stone that was placed in front of the tomb was, you know, they say about two tons, 4,000 pounds roughly, give or take. Not only that, the Romans, of course, as many of you know, had sealed it so that no one was allowed to move it without their permission, and like you could anyway, unless you had a small army of people doing it. Well, stuck in this tomb. Well, Throughout our lives, the devil has and will continue to attempt to bury us in tombs of defeat with stones of finality. For some, their tomb is constructed of the grief that flows from the death of a loved one. For other ones, the tomb is, is a thought life filled with fear, anxiety, doubt, and despair. For still others, it's, a, it's constructed of physical suffering. For still others, it's made of self-destructive addictions and habits. And some find themselves in loneliness without love. And others are covered by defeat as relationships have maybe fallen apart or a lifelong dream has evaporated. But many people long for some kind of purpose in, in life and a life that seems so meaningless. But I got to tell you, Easter brings purpose. Easter brings meaning. Easter brings identity. Some of us remember when you actually had to take uh, you know, your wallet out and you had to take actual cash money out and pay for your gas, right? And I, Steve White told me that he still does that today. He still goes in and pays with cash. Well, good for you. But all the rest of us <laughs> use credit cards. When my kids were just first learning how to drive and, uh, and then they would drive on their own, they didn't have any money, of course. And so we gave them our credit cards with our name on it, but giving them the full rights and privileges. What I had was theirs. They could get whatever they wanted. They even could get uh, some extra chips if they wanted to. They could get gas and a pop. and They couldn't go buy a new car on it, though. But they could do a lot of things. See, what was mine was put into their account. The credit was not there because they earned it. The credit was theirs because what was mine had been given to them in that moment for that purpose. And because I am united to the death of Christ and united to the life or resurrection of Christ, his identity has become mine. And now I, you, we are profoundly loved with his stamp on us because he rose from the dead. Jesus can fill your emptiness. Some of you do feel empty. I want you to know he can fill your emptiness. I want you to know there's nothing he cannot fill with his presence and his power. There's no body on earth that he cannot change. As long as you're breathing, he can change you. He can fill you. He can give you purpose and a plan and meaning. It's going to cost you something, but it's worth it.
And there's one more empty promise at Easter, empty grave clothes. Peter rushed to the tomb and he found Jesus' grave clothes. See, the cross couldn't hold him. The tomb couldn't contain him and the burial clothes were lying there. Jesus was and is alive. Therefore, because of that, I'm able to have a personal daily walk with the living God. And you can too. To those who know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, death has lost its sting. It's no longer something to be feared. And when you and I come to faith in Jesus Christ, when we confess him as Lord and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we become then at that point a new creation. It doesn't always feel like it, doesn't always seem like it, but the fact is we are now new, under new ownership and we no longer have to fear death. Some people are terrified. All people probably at some point are terrified of dying. I want you to know I'm not. I'm not. Now, I don't want to die now. I feel like I still got stuff to do. I want to earn more rewards for when I get there. I don't know about you. Now is the time to earn rewards for eternity. Now's the time to bring more into the kingdom. And the offer is for any of you to join him in that quest. And some of you to consider joining the family of God that you no longer have to fear death. I want to close with this story before we sing a song today. And I'm so glad that so many of you have chosen to come. Thanks for joining us online, uh, those of you that are doing it. And gosh, good, good crowds today. It's so fun to see people here today. And uh, certainly would welcome you to come back next week and the week after, but I'm so glad you came today to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. But a father and son were traveling down a country road one afternoon in the springtime and they had the windows down and suddenly a big old bee came into the car and he was kind of rattling around. And, but the son was allergic to bee stings. It was very allergic. And so this bee was going around and, you know, and the boy was screaming out in terror, you know. So the father eventually was just grab that bee. He just held it in his hand. And then after a while, the dad released the bee again. And it was flying around. And the kid, once again, ah! And the dad showed him his, uh, his hand. And he said, don't worry about it. The sting of death is gone. And he showed him he had taken the stinger. The father had taken the stinger for his son. Jesus took the sting of death away from you and I. Death cannot hurt you anymore. And as many as have received him, he gave the right to become children of God. You can be God's child if you so choose to be. It's by confessing with your mouth, Jesus is your Lord, and believing in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, that you will be saved. And I just want to give an opportunity for anybody who after, after the service of um, if you would like to talk to me about that, I would love to. A couple weeks ago, I gave the same kind of invitation. And somebody, I don't know if you're here today. A guy named Chris came up to me, and he's, he's, uh, he's ne he never even owned a Bible before. Never owned a Bible. He'd been coming to church for three or four weeks. He, and he, he's a football coach, and, you know, so we had a little something to talk about. But he didn't, didn't want to talk about that. He said, you, you said for those that want to give their heart to Christ to come talk to you. And so I... I I talked to other people first and then I was waiting. He, was, he waited patiently and he talked to me and, hey, what can I do for you, buddy? I said, well, you know, you, you talked about an invitation to, oh, oh. He said, I believe in God, he said. I said, that's good. He said, I believe in him. I just don't know him, but I believe in him. I said, do you have a Bible? No, no, never had a Bible. I said, you know, it's great that you believe in God. Even the, even the demons believe and shudder. So it's a good thing, but it's not the whole thing. You must come to the point where you give your heart to Christ when you lay down your life and say, Jesus, be my Lord and Savior. Come in, I invite you. Forgive me of all my sin. It's really that simple and probably that hard because you're admitting you're no longer your own Savior. You're not the boss of your life. When you call Jesus Lord, Lord basically means in a nutshell, boss. He gets to, he gets to call the shots in your life. He's going to make your life better, though promise you that and so I got to lead him to Christ a couple weeks ago in that and then last week several actually <laughs> came to came to faith and today might be your day I just want you to know I'll be up here to talk 
if you want to talk to me about that. Anyway, thanks so much for being here today. Uh, we just